known as the rebound technique. So let's pause uh, and pray, and then I'll open with prayer. Let us begin. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to assemble together as believers in Christ so that we can study the Bible doctrine as found in your word and particularly in this book by Pastor Gene Cunningham. I pray now if there's anything vying for our attention that we would lay those aside for the moment so that we can focus on thee and focus on thy word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you have your books, um, we're going to look at Let's start from the very beginning, beginning with the image. So that way we know exactly why Jean used this particular image. Let's see, I think he commented on this here. <clears throat> so he starts off, I think it's in the book, it's on my PDF version. It says that the beret is a symbol of excellence through training. And believers must excel in both training, Hebrews 5.14, as well as 2 Timothy 2.15, and in practical virtue, as found in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, and in 10, as well as 1 Peter 1.15, or 1.5, I'm sorry, as well as Galatians 5.22, to 23. Every believer should strive to imitate the excellence of Jesus Christ through training, enduring, and overcoming. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And he cites 2 Peter 1 5. He goes on to say, from Henry Longfellow, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. And then he quotes General Douglas MacArthur, Today on friendly fields of strife are sown the seeds that on other days and at other times will bear the fruits of victory. Let's see if I can. As Jesus Christ prepared to send the disciples for the first time throughout Israel with his message, he included in their instructions an admonition, freely you have received, freely give. And he cites Matthew 10.8. This six-word summary of grace explains the financial policy of the publications and audio ministries of basic training. All audio materials and publications are provided without charge to anyone who, who requests them. And it goes on to say, for a catalog of available materials, write basic training Bible ministries. I know that this is just basic reading. You can do this for yourself. But, you know, I just want to honor their ministry by reading it because they do a fantastic job, in my opinion, giving the material free of charge. And so I just want those online as well as us here to know that this is a grace-operated ministry and if we are in a position to assist them, we should. Let's just go right into... what he starts off with here, very customary in most of the doctrinal churches, if not all of them. He goes by saying, before you begin any study of the word, take a few moments of, to make sure that you are in fellowship, which we did with God. Filled with God, Holy Spirit, comprehension like everything else in the Christian life is a gift that can be appropriated only by faith. The Bible clearly lays out three requirements that must be met before we can expect to understand God's word. All three require nothing from us but faith. Number one, we must be believers in Jesus Christ, John 3.16. It is impossible for unbelievers to understand the word of God. 
as taken from 1 Corinthians 2.14. Jesus declared to the leading religious leader of his day that apart from spiritual birth, man is blind to the things of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. John 3.6 Number two, we must be filled with the spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.12 Only the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. And as believers, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But when we sin, we break fellowship with God and cease to function in the power of the Spirit. When we confess our sins, God is faithful or God is always faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 the moment we confess, we are restored to fellowship. And again, under the control, I prefer the word influence rather than control. And the reason being is because if God the Holy Spirit controls you, then there's no way that you can sin because he's controlling you. So the idea here is that he's influencing us as we yield to him, as we confess. And that was something I picked up when, in, during my days of seminary. It was the idea that if the Holy Spirit had firm grip on you, can you break out of his grip? If he's controlling you, what can you do? can't do anything. So my professor said, I think it's preferred that we use the word influence because if he's controlling you, you can't get away. So we adopted that term. So instead of saying God the Holy Spirit controls you, I've learned to use what I've learned in seminary, which is God the Holy Spirit influences us. Because if he controls you, you can't get away. He's going to make you obey. He's going to make you pray. He's going to make you not sin anymore. But obviously that's not the case. So we must be filled with the Spirit. The moment we confess, we are restored to fellowship and again under the influence of the Holy Spirit and therefore able to learn. Number three, we must approach in faith, Hebrews 11.6. Only when we approach in humility with childlike faith will the word of God make sense to us, Matthew 18.4, Hebrews 11.3. Where we find scriptures at odds with our ideas and our desires, we must submit to the authority of the word. Intimacy, understanding, and power are reserved for those who are willing to do God's will. John 7:17. 7, Here is the contents. This is what we're going to be blasting through. Well, not really blasting, but going through. Tonight we're going to hit abiding, the absolute thinking. Uh, section 2 is ambassadorship, then available people, biblical spirituality, the blood of Christ, part 1, the blood of Christ, part 2. Christian walk, Christian way of life, the cross to the crown, Doctrine of spiritual flexibility, endurance, the essence of God, eternal security, faith, the anvil, the faithfulness of God, it goes on to say, fellowship with God, the five commands for Christian soldiers, the five factors of effective faith, five techniques of the Christian way of life, and then the five works of the Holy Spirit, freedom, the last lesson of the Savior, God is able, and then on the next page she goes on to say, the good soldier of Christ Jesus, and then how to redeem time, humility and meekness, the I am sayings of Christ, the imitation of Christ, a life of spiritual power, man's barrier with God, the barrier remove, the overcomer, the power of decision making, priorities of the spiritual life, the royal honor code, seven figures of Christ and the church, seven steps to spiritual growth, the seven steps of spiritual recovery, the seven steps of spiritual retreat, the simplicity of salvation, small things, sure things and spiritual gifts, spiritual rest, take up your cross and follow him, the way of salvation and the way to be salt and light, the work of Christ. So now that leads us to 
the section that we're going to be looking at tonight, which is abiding or absolute thinking as found in John 15, 1 through 10. So, <clears throat> the word abide speaks of perfect provision, supply, sustenance, fellowship, at homeness. Deuteronomy 33, 27 to 28, the eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. So Israel dwells in security in a land of grain and new wine. Note the absolutes. The absolutes here are the eternal God and the everlasting arms. Abide in John 15, 4 is an aorist imperative ingressive, a command possible to all times, at all times because of absolute provisions. And then you have this Psalms 90, 1 and 2. But before we do, before we go there, I want to ask our scholar in training, Mike. Can I ask you a question, Mike? Sure. What is an aorist tense for those of us who are not clear on an aorist tense? I know we know it, but what's an aorist tense in simple terms? Okay. But it's not active. Okay. Meaning it could have time, but it may not have It could. Depends. Okay. First year would say that it's more of a time aspect, but it really depends. Okay. How about the idea? Notice what he says here. Eris imperative ingressive. Do you remember that? The ingressive part? No. Okay. That's okay. That's right. Well, it's okay. I want to, it's in the book, right? So I want to explain that because it's very important because he's going to use that in John 15, 4, right? In the book. Notice what he says here. Let's go to the page here. John 15, 4, he uses the word abide and then he says, it's an eris imperative ingressive. Eris for the, just for simple terms um, and to summarize just in simple terms, it's an action as a whole without focusing on its duration or whether or not it's ongoing. That's a simple way of defining an aorist tense. And like Mike said, there are other things, no other nuances involved depending on the context and whether or not there's other things related to it. But what I'm interested in is Gene uses the, he says, aorist imperative ingressive. And the ingressive part isn't usually mentioned in a lot of our material, but I want to bring that out because it's very helpful for us to understand why he's bringing this out. Number one, it's there in the text. Number two, it's related to John 15, 4. And number three, I think it's, inter it's important for us to know contextually what he means by this. So I'm going to give you an example using a sentence because this kind of relates to martial arts and firearm training and Rick is back there and he knows this because if you don't practice all the time what happens Mike if you don't practice firearm training can you lose it, you lose it. what's that called there's a term it's a perishable. perishable skill so you have to constantly use it right because you can lose it martial arts is the same thing Gene in his book basics I think uh, Scott has it uh, the samurai code is advanced techniques is the basics mastered, right? And so I'm going to use the, the sentence, he threw a punch. The sentence is, he threw a punch. So the sentence implies that a punch occurred in the past without emphasizing the beginning or initiation, right? It's just, he threw a punch. Simple sentence. Now, in the aorist ingressive tense, he started throwing a punch. It's this idea he started. It highlights the moment when he began to throw the punch, as opposed to just he threw a punch. It talks about now the fact that he started. He initiated movement to begin a punch. Why is that important? Because now look at John 15:4 in the book. 
he cites the fact that John 15.4 is a aorist imperative. Um, imperative means command, right? It's a mood of command. But he, cite, he cites this, he says this is a aorist imperative, ingressive of the form abide. So in John 15.4, it suggests a command to initiate or begin the action of abiding. So let me repeat that. In John 15.4, because it's called an aorist imperative ingressive, he's saying it's now initiating, he's commanding us to initiate or begin an action of abiding. Does that make sense? They were not abiding. So he's commanding them to start abiding. Because they were not abiding. Yes, you can, you can certainly say, I'm commanding you to abide. But in here, because of the particular, he wants them to start abiding. Begin. Initiate it. That's the difference. There's a subtle nuance there, but that's part of studying the word. It's important for us to see these things so that we can grow as students of the word. So it's called an aorist ingressive. That's all it is. And the nuance there is start, initiate, begin. Begin abiding. What's, a, what's the word abide mean? Remain. Remain in what? My word. They were not doing that. So he says, get going. Start abiding in my word. So that's the nuance here. That's why Jean says it's an aorist imperative ingressive. Aorist tense, point in time. Very basic. Ingressive aorist is just, look, start. Get going. Imperative mood, mood of command. Get going. This is a command. This is not optional. Do it. Begin what? Begin abiding. What does it mean to abide? Stay, remain in my word. That's important because Gene now wants us to know these other things in the passages that he cites. After that, in John 15, 4, he says, Psalms 90, 91, A and 2, B, Lord, you have been in our, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, even from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. He goes on to say, there is never a time or condition under which the child of God may not abide. The only difference is volition. It's really dependent on one's volition. We have all the provisions to be able to abide. Abide. He goes on to say in Psalms 91, He who dwells in the shelter the secret place of the high, Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, volitional to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress and my God in whom I trust. And then he brings out the Hebrew word batak, body slam, 1 Peter 5, 7. And this idea, let's go to 1 Peter 5, 7 for a moment. <clears throat> 1 Peter 5, 7. Here he says, Casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he... He cares for you. This is the reason why we hurl or cast our cares upon him because he cares for you. He cares for us. That's important to know. So that word there is epiripto. There's active participle of the word casting. That's important because it's the idea of trusting and casting our cares upon God because we can, because he cares for us. So as I was, and as, as I came here, I was listening to some of you pray. I heard Daisy praying and she had a list of things. 
and we were casting our cares upon God because he cares for us. And then I found out tonight about Ralph. I, I was surprised that I, I didn't know about Ralph. But see, we're to cast our cares upon him because God cares for us. And so these th our needs, we cast them onto him. And then he says here, It's the idea of throwing it onto him, hurling it onto God in 1 Peter 5, 7, because he cares for us. We don't have to hold these problems inside. We don't have to keep them to ourselves. You might have issues related to work, relationship with family, problems with um, bills. Hurl our problems, cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And sometimes we need to be reminded of this, whether we're talking about Psalms 91, 1 Peter 5, 7, or even John 15, 4, which we'll see in just a moment, how this kind of ties in together. We have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to abide? When we think of abide, what comes to mind? I know I said dwell, remain. Does anything else come to mind when you remain, stay, what comes to mind, Mike? Abide. Obey. Obey. Okay. Obey. Follow. Follow. Okay. What were you saying, Mike? Dwell. Dwell. Okay. Very good. So I'm going to take us to John in just a moment. But these are all we're drawing and pulling all these things to get these things together because it's all with, related to abide. Since this is the section, abide. Abide in Him. This is, Gene is calling this absolute thinking. And so I think we have to really zoom in closely and see where he's going with this. So, in fact, why don't we take a look at John 8.31. And whoever has that, could you kindly read John 8.31 so that we can connect that with our passage in John, what we just read in John 15, but John 8.51, or 31, I'm sorry. What are we seeing in John? Okay, so... Let's look at this closely. What is he saying here to those who believed him? What can we infer from this? They're believers in the Messiah. They're believers in the Messiah. So what can we say today about believers? Or disciples, actually. Not all are disciples. There's a book written by a professor in Talbot Seminary in California. He said, all believers are disciples. All disciples are believers. But based on John 8.31, is that true? What will determine whether or not a believer is a disciple? You abide in his word. Okay. If you abide in his word, then you are called what? A disciple. So not all believers are disciples. So when we call ourselves, oh, I, I follow Jesus, I pick up the cross, I'm a disciple of Christ. Well, by definition, a disciple of Christ is what? One who abides. So not everyone is a disciple. They have to be a disciple. In order for a person to be a disciple, they have to abide. How many Christians today are clear on that, would you say? They're not abiding. Two. I think, Scott, you put two fingers up? Two, okay? Not very many make the connection or see this. So notice in John 8.31, if you abide in me, conditional clause, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you abide in me, in my word, you are my disciples. So a person can believe in Jesus, but not be his disciples. And so they're not one and the same. It's contingent upon abiding in his word. 
If a person is not abiding in his word, by definition, he's not a disciple. He might be a believer, but he's not a disciple. Do we see this today? Many people are believers, but not disciples? Yes. They don't come to church. They don't come to Bible class. They just kind of lay low, and they're very lax. They're lackadaisical when it comes to spiritual things. Why? Because they're not disciples. They haven't spent enough time in Bible doctrine. They're not inculcating truth. And as such, they will not see the distinctions as found in John 8.31. They're going to say, well, as long as I'm saved, I'm happy. I think the problem today in churches is it's, we, we see a very lackadaisical attitude today. We're seeing all kinds of things around the world and people are just kind of lax. The pressure is going on all around the world. Third world countries, there's people suffering. Lives are being tormented because they're making a stand for God. You know, unfortunately, we're not pulling together and staying st st standing firm in God's word. And be as such, third world countries are being impacted hard. They're being hit hard. Because we have not done our part in holding the line here in America. We used to be the pivot. I don't think we're considered the pivot anymore. It's now based on locale, not country anymore. The U U.S. used to be the muscle for the world. They were, f they were in love with God. God was blessing us. But now it's no longer the same. Unfortunately, we are seeing the downfall of our country because we're no longer putting doctrine first. We're no longer putting God first. We're no longer seeing the distinctions as set forth in God's word. We just looked at one verse tonight thus far in John 8.31. We see people who are believers. He goes on to say, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, or who believed him, if you abide, then you are my disciples. So if you don't abide, you're not my disciples. And there's a long list of things that will prove to be dangerous. Let's take a look at John 8, 30 and 32. Okay. Let me see. I think we looked at... There's a reason why I wanted us to look. Maybe that's not the one. Go up to John 15:4. This is a passage that we're familiar with, and we looked at this earlier this year. But based on what we're seeing with regards to abiding, please look at four. What can we conclude based on four? John 15:4. Okay, you can't bear fruit unless you abide in what? Abide in Him. Mm -hmm. So th now it's talking about abiding in Him. So this is a little different from what we saw in John 8, right? In John 8, we are to abide in what? His Word. In John 15, 4, we are told to abide in Him. Slight difference. Kind of like what I, I was covering in my one of my studies at night class. There's a time to put our faith in Jesus Christ, the living word. But there's also a time to put our faith in the written word. One is the living word. The other one is the written word. So in here, we're talking about abiding in him. John 15, 4. John 8, it's abiding in his word. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Yes, sir. Um, this is, is this experience 
Experiential sanctification we're talking about? Yes, experiential sanctification. In fact, they're commanded to abide in him. So there's a sense where in John 8, we abide in his word. And here he's talking about abiding in me, staying in me. How do we stay in Christ? What do we do when we're, what's it called when we're not in Christ? Huh? Out of fellowship. So how do we get back in fellowship? First John 1 John 1.9. So there are times where the focus is to f- talk about our inness with Christ. Because if we're not in fellowship with Him, if we're not abiding in Him, then we have no power. We have no ability. We have no influence from God the Holy Spirit. We always talk about rebound, rebound, rebound. Why do we rebound? To get back into fellowship. That's connected to abiding in Him. And there's the sense that you have to abide in his word. John 8, what's that referring to? John 8. When he talks about abiding in his word, what's the purpose and advantage of abiding in his word? Continuous action. action, And what does that fulfill? When we abide in his word. Knowledge. Knowledge. That's good. What else? So what's the purpose for abiding in His Word as opposed to abiding in Him? Why do we abide in His Word? That's right. We, ap- we will reach a level of maturity as we renew our minds in the Word. What's Romans 12 to say? <laughs> yeah, you can. Look, you can look. It's important. We're connecting the dots here. Why are we to... Re- huh? We're to stay in His Word. We're to stay in Him as far as familial fellowship is concerned. But John 8 talks about fellowship or abiding in my Word. So what's Romans 12 to say? It's in the book of Romans. How's that? I can give you a hint. Be not fashioned according to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, very good. You are transformed how? The renewing of your mind. And that is, what are we taking in in order for us to be renewed? The mind renewed. What are we taking in? The Word of God. There you go. If we renew our mind in the Word, we will what? We will not be like the world. That's that word metamorphuo, transformed. Don't be like the world, but be the opposite. How? Renewing your mind. So if you're not renewing your mind in the Word of God, Bible doctrine, John 8, if you're not renewing in your mind, you're renewing your mind, getting into the Word. Number one, you're acting just like a believer. You're not being a disciple of His. If you're being a believer, then you're missing out on a whole slew of things that comes with the provision, the divine provisions, as set forth in God's Word. Sure, you can pray. Sure, you're saved, but you're missing out on a whole gamut of things. What about peace? How many of you need peace? How many of you need stability in life? Amidst all the stuff that we're seeing around the world, we get hit hard. We have issues, challenges, problems, left and right. The adversary is trying to devour us. What's the scripture say? He goes around like a roaring lion trying to pounce, trying to devour. So look, we're going to get hit. Why? Because the world is not causing a ruckus, Satan doesn't care about the world. He only is going to attack you and me. So if you're starting to make progress in your relationship with God, he's going to hit you. He's going to hit you hard. Why? Because he wants to slow you down so that you're not going to advance the cause of Christ. As long as you are doing nothing for God, he's not going to bother you. But if you are, if you start to read your word, start to get serious with Bible doctrine, you start to take seriously scripture, going to church, going to Bible class, that's the time he's going to try to slow you down. All of a sudden, your phone will start ringing all the time. All your friends from 
yesteryear are going to call you and you're going to say, well, I, don't, I can't go to class tonight because my friend is calling me and I haven't talked to him in a long time. There's going to come all sorts of distractions to prevent you and I from getting into the Word. So you see this John 8, Romans 12, John 15, 4, if you don't abide in me, what, what else is the consequence of not abiding in him? John 15. What do you see here in John 15? For abide in me, remain in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless what? Unless you abide in me. So he's saying if you are not attached to Christ, and they are, positionally speaking, and Scott brought that out earlier, is this sanctification? It is. This is phase two. This is not phase one. This is phase two. Phase two now is all the imperatives, all the commands geared to the believer. If the believer will just follow the imperatives as set forth in the word of God, then we're now going to say we're abiding in his word. But positionally speaking, once saved, always saved, the indwelling of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, a well, one-time deal. But it's affected when we commit sin. When you and I sin, rebound. That should be instantaneous. You must know, like the back of your hand, okay, I had a bad thought. I said something wrong. I was thinking bad about Scott today. Rebound. Right? We do that. And so that's how we get back into fellowship as set forth in John 15, but John 18 is slightly different because he wants us to abide in his word. That's how, we in, that's how we get to grow and advance in our spiritual life. What does Jesus say about the truth? You will know the truth and it will set you free. A lot of people are stuck in all sorts of things. But it's not until they engage the word of God that they're going to be set free. They're going to get caught up with um, legalism. Reform theology, all sorts of things that go contrary to Scripture and they're going to feel like, i got to do this, i got to do that. And they're going to think they have to be perfect in order for God to, to accept them. But that's far from the truth. We know that as fact. But how many people do you know that are living like that today? They're not free because they don't know the truth. It's only when we share the truth of God's Word to them starting with faith alone and Jesus Christ alone, will they ever get set free? It was Jesus himself who said, the truth will set you free. Where are we now? Let's see. I have two more hours, Scott, was it? Two hours, okay. Okay, I think, let's see, where did we go? Point number four. So there's never a time, let me go back to three, there's never a time or condition under which the child of God may not abide. Again, that's because it's your volition and mine. You can exercise your volition. It's all up to you. We looked at 1 Peter 5, 7, Psalms 91, 4. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. Top of page two. His faithfulness or absolute is a shield and bulwark. That's a wall. That means a protection for you and me. Psalms 91, 5 and 6. And then he continues with Psalms 91, 9 through 10. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will what? Befall you. There's no evil that can touch you or touch God. Point number four, the key to abiding is living in the reality of the absolute divine provisions. Then he lists four of them. John 13, 17, if you know these four absolutes, salvation, security, spirituality, and service, you are blessed or joyful if you do them or live by them. So let's, let's go over these four. What, is it, what do you know about salvation? You must know these things. What can you say about salvation? One save, always save. Always save. Very good, Darren. You want to lead the Good News Club? Uh, uh, Mike? Were you going to say uh, salvation? 
I thought you were raising your hand. No, I'm... Oh, you're poor. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were raising your hand like this. Scott, you were saying something about salvation? What can you add to self? Faith alone in Christ alone. Very good. How about security? What can you say about security? Are you secure? Yes. How secure are you? Are you confident that what you're believing in today is truth? How do you know what you're believing in is truth? There's hundreds of religions out there. What makes you so confident that the faith that you have now in Jesus Christ is the only faith? You mean all these Muslims, millions and millions of them are going to go to hell? The resurrection. The resurrection? How do you know? Were you there, Mike? Were you there and saw Jesus Christ rise? There is a lot of evidence. Yeah, but no one was really there. And who said this? Who, who recorded this? Uh, yeah, but they were men, right? And you're, you're quoting your book to support your belief system. How do we know that that's even true? It's the one place that has, I mean, the one religion, you know, one call, really. Christianity is based on faith alone, Christ alone. No other religion is based on faith alone. Yeah. Faith alone in Christ and, and I can appreciate that. But are you sure, Scott, that Christianity is the only system out there that is faith alone? I mean, Muslims would say they have faith in Allah and the book. It works. Yeah, they have works. There, don't you? Don't you guys uh, do good works? Yep. See, you're doing the Good News Club. That's works. Two aren't tied together. It's the result of salvation. The result of salvation. Okay. But I mean, how do you guys know? You guys are Christians, I, I believe, right? How do you know, sir, what's your name, sir? Theron. Ther, how do you know, Theron, that this faith, this church is the only church among all the millions of religions out there? This guy here said, I think it's Scott, right? I think so. Okay. He said it was faith alone. Really? Our salvation is not based on this church. So why are you here? To, to, to learn and to fellowship. But okay, well, we do that too in our in our mosque. You do? Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, we, we, we don't cut people's heads off. <laughs> they don't believe. We don't do that. <laughs> you got me there. Uh, yeah, yeah. But how do you really know that your system is the only system? I mean, there's millions of people. The, the latest uh, statistic is that there's 7 billion, pe 7, 7 billion people on this earth. You mean to tell me if they don't believe in what you guys believe in, then they're all going to hell? Is that really a loving, gracious God? That is? That doesn't seem gracious to me. Why would he hurl 7 billion people who do not believe in what National Capital Bible Church believes in because they don't know Jesus Christ? Does that seem gracious? But, but, you know, the Bible says that everyone has, knows. Everyone knows yeah. about what? God? Yeah. Or, really? Because, because God, everyone has a chance. Now, whether they take it or not, that's... But what if they don't have the opportunity to, to believe? Like, for example, people who, like, didn't you tell me earlier that someone near your place got shot? Yeah. You jumped to the ground because you heard shots? Right. So if that guy got shot and he died, is it really fair that God would send him to hell? I mean, that doesn't seem gracious. We, we don't know. He may be in heaven now. We don't know. Okay. Rejection. Rejection. Okay, you guys are too hard for me. Okay, we'll go. Let, let's push on. But I just wanted to challenge your thinking a little bit because this is what this kind of study is going to entail for you guys to be on your toes and interact because that's part of learning, right? Well, so when, you're, when, you're, when you become a Christian, when you accept the gospel, mm -hmm. you're as well by the Holy Spirit. God changes you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, he changed. Okay. Um. 
Well, you, yeah, but but you still end up going to heaven because right. of belief. What, what I'm just saying. Yeah. Too, you someone else you're trying to convince that. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You're not convincing yourself of someone else. Yeah. You know yourself. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know a lot of people who change too. And they're not Christians. You know, they, they're just good moral people. Right, but I thought you meant how do we know? Oh, how do you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Okay. What I think of is the first we were dealing with where, where, you know, you had to divide and Somebody was in hell. And somebody oh, Lazarus was and, Lazarus. and and Lazarus said, "Well, man, if, if you can't give me any water, at least send somebody to my brothers." That's right. And Jesus said, "Man, you that's not going to make any difference if they can't believe right. you. What what you told them? Jesus Christ could come down Himself and talk to some of these people." And it would make no difference because he did come down yeah. and talk to him, and it made no difference. God respects positive evolution. If people have it, God will see to it that they get the information, just like the people at Nineveh. Right. And uh, Jonah was sent. <clears throat> want to go? Mm -hmm. But God sent him. He got a special water taxi, I understand. <laughs> and uh, they believed in roads. Okay, that's that's good. And young lady? <laughs> well, Pastor Dan's not here, but is it okay if I quote from Yeah, of course. How he answers this question. Yeah. It's a really good answer. Why does God hurl people into hell? Right. God doesn't send people to hell. It's his desire that we all Mm -hmm. We have volition. We make the decision for ourselves. So it's okay. our personal decision. It's not God's personal. decision. He doesn't want anyone. To okay, it. so it's a personal deci our decision. decision. Because we have free will. Okay, that's that sounds okay. <laughs> that's very good. It has. before the age of accountability, will go to heaven. Okay. What was your name again, ma'am? Uh, Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> you seem to be pretty good yourself. The other young lady there. So, very good. And, sir, in the back, you are, what's your name? Yeah, you. My name is Jose. <laughs> Jose. Well, you guys are pretty solid here, so I can't uh, arm wrestle you guys. So let's move on. Let me continue now. Um, we stopped at, uh, let's go to five. Oh, we're on four. If you know these four things, salvation, security, spirituality. Real quickly summarize spirituality. How does a person become spiritual? What do they have to do? They have to pick up the cross and follow Jesus? What's it mean to be spiritual? Hmm? Filling of the Holy Spirit. So, how does that happen? How does that occur? You have to be a believer. Okay. In okay. So, be be a believer and in fellowship. Okay. Very good. So, spirituality is really well. I I like to explain it like this: To be a Christian, you have to be rightly aligned with Jesus Christ. To be spiritual, you have to be rightly aligned with God the Holy Spirit. So, when you're rightly al aligned with God the Holy Spirit via 1 John 1, 9, you're therefore spiritual because you have the Holy Spirit in you, right? So the indwelling never changes. The fellowship does. So when you're properly adjusted to the Holy Spirit, you're therefore spiritual. You can never lose the Christian part, justification, phase one. That's always a very real part of your life. So Theron will always be justified, phase one. He will always be a Christian that never changes. What if he's a bad person? He joins ISIS. Does that change anything? Not at all. But you'll be surprised how many people say, oh, he uh, abandoned the faith. He may have, but he's, is he still saved? 
Yes, once a son, always a son, right? So number five, abiding means there is total provision for every need, not want, of every believer at every point of his life. He quotes Psalm 23, 1 to 5, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, my cup overflows. So that's total provision right there. God is always going to take care of you. James 1, 2 and 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, referring to the believers, when you encounter some trials, various trials, some translations will render it many, various trials or many trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect? Wow, we can be perfect on this side of eternity? It's not really referring to being perfect or sinless. It's the idea of being mature. That you may be mature, complete, lacking in nothing. So that you'll be ready for every good work. Mature, lacking in nothing. So if you want to get someone who's, who's going to be successful in the ministry, someone who's going to help in the ministry, get them in the Word. Get them to get grounded in, in the Word and let them know that as they're going through trials, whether it's anybody here or someone online or someone who's going to come later on to NCBC, as they're getting hit with trials, those trials will fortify them, preparing them for every good work and also accelerating their spiritual life. Because it says here, the testing of your faith produces or results in endurance. And then James says, let endurance have its perfect result so that you might be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So when you're getting hit with trials, God might be preparing you some, for something because it says that you may be perfect or mature, complete, lacking in nothing. So one of the ways God will fortify us and prepare us for every good work is through hardship, the testing of our faith. Number six, earthly problems are temporal and variable, changing left and right. But divine solutions are absolute. God's solutions are there for us. Look at what Genesis 50, 20 says. You meant evil against me, but God, what? Meant it for good. Help me understand the context. What's going on in Genesis 50, 20? Let's make sure we're on the same page here. What, what happened? What does it mean that... What's that? Joseph. It is Joseph. What happened with Joseph? Well, he, he was taken uh, so very much mistreated by his brothers, and he was confined and sold into slavery. Right, and sold into uh, slavery. Good. He had a pretty rough time for a while in Egypt. Yeah. What was he? What was he doing in Egypt? Well, he uh, he was in prison, and. Uh, he, he basically interpreted the dream of Pharaoh. That's right. As far as the the, the lean cows and the and the fat cows, and it had to do with seven years of prosperity. That, yeah. And seven years of leanness, and right. Pharaoh made him number one, number two under him. Right. So. And and what did the what did the um, Soldier, what do you call the gatekeepers? What the the men who are watching the gates, the the prison? They noticed him and they said that God blessed him, even within prison itself, in the jail cell, he was prospering. And all those who were watching him knew that God was working with him. He was being blessed, and that's why he was able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh because. They knew, they got their eyes on Joseph, that even though he was in a dungeon, in a prison, they said, this guy is special. 
There's something about Rick. There's something about this guy in prison. He seems like God is always on his side. He's always gracious. He's always kind. And there's something about this guy. And then it says they remembered him. So it could be that there's something going, going on in your life, in your surroundings, and people's got their eyes on you. They're watching you. And they're going to say, I remember Jerry. You know, let's call Jerry. Let's call Vanessa. I think there's something about her. And God blessed Joseph while in prison. So now you get to Genesis 50:20. Now what happens, Rick? When he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. What, what, what's he talking about there? You remember? He, uh, he said that he became number two for good. And, uh, but who, who did he say that to? His brothers. His brothers. His brothers. His brothers yeah. He said it to his family. Yeah. And what, what, why did he say this? I mean, what's the impact? What can we get out of this? How can we utilize this practical application for us? How would you point this, how would you share this with someone who might be going through hardship? Well, I mean, it's, I mean he had, you know, when, when his father died, mm-hmm. and the brothers, they were all together and they, and they were worried mm-hmm. that once his father died that Joseph would remember what, oh, yeah. what they did to him. And, and he said, he said, hey, I, I I forgive you. You know, I, I, I'm not. You know, that's water over the dam. Right, sir. Let it go. And, and that's that's kind of hard to do. You would think after what Joseph went through, he he was lied to. He, he they told his dad that a bear ate him. Yeah. And then this at the end, at the, the final climax, is you guys meant this for evil, but in from divine perspective. God meant it for good. You all mean, meant it for evil, human perspective, but God, Joseph looked at this from a divine perspective and he said, you know what? No. Because God orchestrates all the details, and I'm sure of that, this is meant for good. You guys meant it for evil, not me. God meant it for good. As he's working in your life and mine, and we'll close here, as he's working in your life and mine, we have to adopt the divine perspective. These basic truths here that we're going to cover are going to help solidify our confidence in the living God so that when we get hit with a situation like Joseph, we're going to be able to say, you know what, you meant it for evil, but no, 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 God meant it for good. But their family, yes, sometimes family will shred you behind your back. They'll talk ill about you. They'll say all kinds of things, but in the end, God meant it for good. It may not make sense now, but it took how many years? 20 plus years before Joseph was able to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now come, you guys are hungry, right? Don't worry, I got you. He now del- he was able to provide salvation for his family. In fact, he said, you guys move over here. You guys meant it for evil, but guess what? It worked out. Remember when you were mean at me, you sold me into slavery? It's all all good. It's all water under the bridge. Because God meant this for good. You want to talk about divine perspective? There you go. That's an example of divine perspective as a result of the inculcation of Bible doctrine on a consistent basis. Otherwise, you're going to say, like Joseph, you're going to say, you know what? You guys ought, ought to rot. It's your fault. You starved to death. Yeah, but you're 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 second hand. You're king. You're an assistant now. I, yep. Later. But he didn't say that. With the right perspective, God's perspective, he was able to say, "You wronged me. Do you know what I went through?" You could have said, "Like I went through hell. Do you know what I did? I went through prison. You guys wronged me." But he said, in the end, you meant it for evil. But you know what? God's got this. I know He is using this right now to convict you guys, and as such, God meant it for good. So this is where we'll close, and next week we will continue now with ambassadorship. So hopefully you guys will return. And those online, we've got um, six people. That's pretty good. Marty's there too. Very good, Gordon. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll call it a night. 
Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to review and examine truths that we may have already known, but sometimes we need to hit it again and again. We know that this is repetition is the key and the mother to learning. So, Father, as we go through these truths, I pray and trust that we will make adjustments where necessary in our own personal lives, that you might be honored and glorified, because that's the overall objective, just not the inculcation of information and material in an academic sense, but so that we can take these truths and live it out, impacting others for the cause of Christ, thus allowing others to see that we are salt and light of the world, as per your imperatives in Matthew and so on. We ask and pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.